I really enjoyed our uh, our conversation today with you on this. As as you know, ATMs is one of those topics that I really yes. enjoy. It's sort of where I cut my teeth in this industry way back when. Right. Um, but you know, I we he really makes a great case for why ISOs and agents should should you know should add ATMs to their portfolio of services. Well, and I think even more than that, he makes a great case for why ATMs are relevant today. Which, yeah. which again, as you know, during the interview, I got a little surprised actually by some of the things he was uh -huh. talking about where I, I started to get more and more interested because I'm obviously I'm the, the newer person, you know, as far as between us and payments. And so, right. you know, I was kind of like, oh, ATMs. I mean, that sounds kind of interesting, but like, you know, I get it for the money, but then I was like, wait a minute, hold on. This is a big, so, you know, crypto yeah. we're talking about and all kinds of crazy stuff where I'm like, wow, I never even thought about all that. So um, yeah. definitely that was uh, very interesting. And then um, tell us about the insiders report, Patty. Uh, we have some really good economic news. I really think you're going to be, um, everybody's going to be intrigued by uh, the new business startups we've been experiencing in the past couple of years. And uh, James and I talk about some of the opportunities that creates. I really and think then, this this might be one of the best, most valuable insiders reports that Patty has ever done. Um, the numbers shocked me, actually. So uh -huh. you need to listen to this one. This is very relevant, whether you're an ISO or an individual agent. Um, and then in the questions from the field, I talk about to hire or not to hire. That is the question. So right. <laughs> I gave some hiring tips, whether you're uh, an individual agent and you don't have any employees mm -hmm. and you're starting to kind of maybe spin your wheels in the mud a little bit, or maybe you're just working more than you want to work. And you're like, I want to make more money, but I don't want to work more hours. And you're right. willing to make a sacrifice financially and, and with your time over a short period of months to get mm -hmm. somebody trained up to help you. I talk about that. And then also if you're an ISO executive, ISO owner, um, you know, something along those lines, I talk about the keys to, you know, choosing the right people for these positions um, and then, you know, being able to position yourself to scale. Um, yeah. So, Patty, this episode, of course, is sponsored by Valor Paytech. Um, CCSalesPro.com right. slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R. So, ready to start the show, James? Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Everybody, we are here today with Jonas Marcos. Jonas is the president and CEO at Star Financial. How are you doing today, Jonas? Hey, James. How are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Um, We're all doing awesome. great, right? We are. That's we right. Are, <laughs> we are excited to talk about ATM. So um, it's been a little while. This is one of Patty's favorite topics. One of um, my topics. I don't think we've done this in a couple of years, James. No, it's been quite a while. Um, so we're going to talk about ATM and, and kind of dispel, I think, some of these myths that even a lot of the ISOs would have. That, oh, ATM, you know, that's kind of, that's out of date. That doesn't apply. No, no, no. Like, yeah, this we're is in important. a cashless society. We don't yeah, need right. no ATMs. Um, you know, <laughs> so... We're going to dive into all that. Um, before we dive into that, though, Jonas, I want to get your story. Tell our audience, I know you've been doing this for a long time. How did you get into this crazy industry? How did you end up uh, with, you know, Star Financial and, and kind of trying to dominate this ATM business? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it, James. Thank you for having me again. Uh, Patty, pleasure to meet you as well. So my story is kind of crazy. You know, I, uh, I, st I got into ATMs by accident. Um, you know, I would, you know, I had graduated from college and, um, uh, you know, I was looking for a side, side hustle, basically, and uh, um, it landed on a, a web page that said that I can earn money by placing an ATM machine in a business. And uh, that was that was basically it. And then I started some conversations with an accountant that I had at the time that placed me uh, into a tanning salon from all places uh, that was... Wow. Uh, that's that, a while back, needed, I bet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a while back. Yes, that was 15 years ago. <laughs> right, because, you know, they're not as that popular was, as they used to be. <laughs> 100%, 100%. Uh, and the owner was, uh, you know, the owner was uh, actually, uh, you know, needing a functionality for tips. So she was like, I need to have, I need to have an ATM machine in my store. So uh, my accountant connected me to her, to that owner and uh, we placed the ATM machine and that was my first one. That's how I got in. Wow. I was an agent under an ISO then. Uh, we're our, you know, we're a registered ISO now, but at that time we, we you know, we were, we, were, we placed ATMs under uh, an agent program and uh, that's, that's how I got started. And that was 15 years ago today. And uh, you know, we're, we're in 30 states, you know, we deploy nationally. Um, so it's it's been a great ride. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great ride. And, you know, it's interesting. And I, as I was saying early when, when we first started talking before we started recording, how this is a topic that's kind of dear to me, you know, because I've always wondered why, you know, ISOs and agents, 
don't really look at selling ATMs. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's like we're going to sell card services, ATMs, and, you know, let's let somebody else deal with that. But it's, you know, right. I think it's an important topic, it's, you know, for the ISO and the aging community. And I've, I've said this for, for a while, but I'd love to hear your take on it. You know, why do you think uh, this is something that ISOs and agents should uh, should look at? That's a, that's a great point, Patty, because uh, ATMs is actually really a complementary product to right. card services. You know, it's not, you know, some of my best locations today are uh, are locations that accept card pay- as, as, as their mm-hmm. major form of payment. So mm-hmm. it's a complementary product. Agents, ISOs today need to be able to take advantage of, you know, that stickiness in a relationship, right, right. Um, to... to um, to have an ATM service and, and we'll delve into this, but I mean, there's multiple ways that, you know, we can assist ISOs agents to be able to, you know, uh, you know, to be able to take advantage of those type of programs, you know, for merchant, you know, merchant services is a complete different beast than, than, than ATM programs. Right. But, you know, it's significantly less complicated Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) than, than card services. So, um, so yeah, I think you know ATMs and card services or card service or merchant services is really a complementary type of product. You know they're not you know oh my god a card, a card services in there and I can't put an ATM. Right. You know it's really complementary. Yeah, they're, they're yeah, sort of like cousins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a way to put it. I think it's interesting too. You know, with the rise of cash discounting and programs like yeah. that, where you know in in you know, some abstract way, you know, we're kind of pushing the consumer to cash. Um, right. And a lot of these larger businesses, you know, for them to have an actual cash option, um, you know, there's some benefits that I think, I think even just showing, yeah, cash is available. Here's what it costs um, right. versus, you know, the cash discount. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know, let me ask you this, Jonas, you know, as you look at the ATM market, you know, you've been in this business for 15 years, you know, where is this headed? We hear a lot about the cashless society, which seems to be yeah. a very long way off, but at any rate, um, you know, we, we hear things like this, where do you see this market going over the next three to five years? How do we kind of get out in front of it? What are your thoughts on kind of the future of the ATM? Yeah, that's a great question, James. So, uh, so even though a lot of people or a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I, we call it noise around, uh, around cash and society or anything like that. It's just not, uh, you know, less people might have used cash, like say during the pandemic, right? But it bounced right back. I can tell you, we did not see a slowdown in the pandemic. I mean, we, mm-hmm. we, we saw a slowdown, you know, everybody did March, April, but then after that, the demand for cash just went through the roof again. Right. So, you know, um, in the next three to five years where we see uh, ATMs and cash is really evolving, you know, so ATM is not only going to be a cash dispensing terminal. It's going to be where, you know, people reload their phones, where people buy gift cards or, uh, even where they accept, you know, reloadable, uh, you know, like deposits for reloadable cards. So it's going to evolve. Technology is going to come in. Uh, today, for example, people are able to buy Bitcoin at an ATM. I was just going to ask you about that because I saw yeah. Bitcoin ATM not long ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So big and and big. There's Bitcoin companies that are coming up with solutions that are uh, that are both ways, right? You know that you can insert cash to purchase Bitcoin and also redeem your, you know, your Bitcoin cash out model. So the ATM is definitely going to involve around around those lines. Today, you can also do uh, what's called the DCC or dynamic currency conversion. You know, international people come into the country all the time. Tourist locations are popular with this. You know, people now can withdraw their home currency at an ATM convert, you know, converting the exact amount uh, to the dollar. So, um, you know, so ATMs is going to, you know, they're they're going to evolve, add additional services, products, um, and evolve that way. But, uh, you know, yeah. You know, I'm actually a little surprised by your answer. I love it. I, I didn't really think about it that way. Let me, I have a kind of follow up on that, you know, so what you just described obviously sounds fantastic. And there's a lot of kind of um, significant functionality there. I'm just curious, do you feel like the hardware that you are placing today is positioned, you know, to um, be able to implement some of these new things over the next three to five years? Or are you talking about 
just the, the foundational like hardware of these ATMs is going to be changing dramatically and replacing ATMs. Like, I'm just kind of curious, like, cause there's good and bad with that with both. I could see yeah. like, if you have yeah. to replace them, that could be good. Cause you go to existing ATM places and say, you should use our ATM. It's better. And it does more stuff, but I could yeah. also see, you know, well, yeah, but then you place them and now you got to replace them. Like, what are your thoughts on that? As far as hardware goes? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm a firm believer of, you know, updating your equipment you know, consistently, you know, um, because ATMs, you can place them and you can forget about it. That, that machine is going to work for a while outside right. of changing components inside. Right. right. Um, but as you, you know, as you grow a portfolio, for example, you have to be at the latest cusp of technology because of, uh, you know, PCI updates or software security or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for for us our fleet is always you know evolving it's always changing yeah. you know we're always changing it out of three in three to five years we're always changing the equipment so you know for a portfolio like ours for example it's just really a an, an upgrade if you will you know so if it's a deposit accepting functionality it's a sidecar we call it a sidecar that you would add next to the atm oh. and then it's a software upgrade to the eight to the actual okay. atm to recognize that oh. sidecar um, but the That's ATMs cool. that have been in the field, you know, you know, seven years, eight years ago, you know, they may not have that pathway to upgrade, but right. there is, you know, depending on the ATMs that are in the, in, in, in the field, there's that, uh, capability, right. Um, yeah. uh, but, but, they, but the dynamic currency conversion, Bitcoin, uh, like we were mentioning with, with Patty, um, uh, those are all software upgrade functionalities. Right. Uh, so you can, you know, you know, if 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 agent ISOs go into a location and say, hey, you know, we can provide this, maybe that the company that's there is not willing to, you know, do that. Do that. Right, yeah. Right, so you right. can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's where that's where, you know, it's an it's a conversation. So the, so the like idea that. is to to place uh, ATNs that are sort of future proof. Right. Is that, you know, rather than exactly. getting like and these bare bones things, you want to get a you want to place. Uh, a, a, a machine that's robust enough to be future proof. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I like that. And, exactly. and, and again, I think from a sales perspective, you know, one of the issues with um, selling ATM, of course, is that because it has been around a long time, you know, a lot of the premium places where you'd want to put an ATM maybe already have an ATM, but you know, because it's correct. always evolving, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I would imagine that because it's always evolving, you know, now is probably a really good time to start as an ISO agent saying, well, wait a minute, you know, this is a real, we'll talk about this, but you know, this is probably a really good place where they're doing a lot of, a lot of transactions. Let me go in there and pitch them on reloadable cards and Bitcoin and et cetera, et cetera. Right. Is that, is that kind of, what Absolutely. Kind of you're 100%. Yes, sir. Yep. That's, that's great. great. I yeah. love it. Okay. All right. So, so let's, we've got the high level stuff. I think um, our audience, I think has a rough idea here of kind of this opportunity, which is, is great. Even honestly, even better than what I thought. It's funny. I love recording these because I always get surprised myself. You know, I really and I also love about, it. Right. You know, ahead, and Patty. I love it when like something I'm high on James finally gets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. The ATM, it can actually do a little bit more than dispense money. Okay, cool. Right. Right. Um, so I like it. All right. So now I'm, now you have me on board a little more here. So now, Let's talk about uh, let's talk about the details. So let's say you know we have an ISO or an agent, and they're like, okay, they're they're like me. You know, they're like, oh, that sounds cool. I'd like to sell that. So how do they know if they're a good fit for this? You know, what's you know what should they be? You know, how should they be evaluating this to say you know either our organization or as an individual agent, like yeah, we'd probably be a good fit to go out and sell ATMs. What what would be some criteria you'd look at there? So so it really just depends on uh, you know it depends on the type of clients or or portfolio that they have, right? Sure. So if, if, if they're focused on card not present, probably won't work out, you know? Sure. <laughs> and and I'm just blanketing that, right? You know, not to say that it, it won't, but um, but it's really about having a conversation, you know, um, you know, give us a call. Let's see the type of merchants that your target market is, your, your niche is, mm -hmm. and, um, and let, let's let's dive deeper to just understand exactly you know how we can uh, place ATMs or 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 sell the ATMs to the merchants you know so that we can devise a type of program for the agent or for the ISO. 
And, and can you give a little more context for, you know, because this I know is very different with ATM, you know, what type of businesses are you looking for? Maybe, or right. maybe even criteria foot traffic, like talk a little bit more, because again, in our industry, you know, the fact that a business does a lot of credit card processing volume doesn't necessarily mean that it would be a great place to put an ATM machine. So can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So you definitely want, you definitely want the locations that are getting that, uh, getting high, higher foot traffic is, is a good indication of, you know, you're going to get more transactions, mm -hmm. correct? Um, but with cash discount, we've seen that kind of go out the window because, um, uh, well, it, the reason is because when, when the cash discount model is implemented, say, at a restaurant, that traditionally would be what we would consider a slower location, you know, without a cash discount model. But a full cash discount model in place, the restaurant or or that business is offering uh, a cash option to save X amount. So there's several programs that we can implement that way that, you know, together with a cash discount type of program to, uh, you know, to increase traffic at the ATM. But ideally, yes, foot traffic is the greatest indicator of how busy an ATM can be. Yes. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So, so now as we, as we think about this and, you know, and this is what I'm really excited to talk to you about actually, because I think this is what our industry is actually missing is that, you know, those that are listening are maybe thinking, well, this sounds really interesting. And yes, I have, you know, some high foot traffic businesses, but I don't know anything about ATMs. I don't want to go, what do, how does this work? How do I load the money in? How do I, you know, they don't have a clue. So talk about involvement, yeah. right? Like how yeah, involved right. does an ISOR agent need to be in order to make money off of this, which is what they really want to do versus how yeah. would they partner with a company like yours? So give us a little context there. Yeah. So for, so for us, you know, because I started exactly where, you know, with one ATM and feeding the ATM ourselves and everything like that, you know, um, the agent or the ISO that signs up with us can say, hey, listen, you know, I want to be involved this much mm -hmm. or I want to be involved this much. So right. we tailor the program for them so they can be as involved or as least involved as they as they want is the is the is the beauty of this. So, you know, if they say, hey, you um, here's this store, you know, and they want an ATM. And, you know, this is my recurring revenue split or whatever. And, and that's it, you know, so we take care of everything from there. They don't have to worry about feeding the, the, the ATM or servicing it or installing it or maintaining it, et cetera. Um, but if they, but if they say, Hey, you know, we want to maintain it. It's right down this, right down the street from my house. It's in my neighborhood. I can take care of that. You know, I, you know, I want more skin in the game. A hundred percent more than, more than happy to sit you up that way. So it's really up to the agent or the ISO, how involved they need us to be. So the ISO, ISO or the agent could actually sell the ATM service to the merchant Cor or correct. they could refer them to you and then you would do the actual sales processes. Did I did I interpret that correctly? One hundred percent, yes, Patty. You're you're correct. Yep. Okay. So so how does the financial model work, Jonas? I mean, I know you can't be really specific, but I mean, what's in it for the ISO or the agent that wants to get into ATMs? I mean, is there is there really money to be made? Absolutely, there's definitely money to be made. Um, uh, so again, it really depends on the level of involvement for, you know, the ISO or the agent. So uh -huh. if they're resell if they're reselling the ATM, they, you know, they're reselling the ATM and the service, you know, just like they would be reselling, um, you know, a deja vu terminal and, okay. um, and, and obtaining a re reoccurring revenue for, for that sales, you know, from that transaction processing opportunity for that merchant. And if they're, if they're having us handle, you know, the purchase of the asset and maintaining the ATM and the service, uh, we do the same thing. We we allow them to earn, um, you know, whatever the opportunity is for that for, for that uh, for that agent ISO. Uh, you know, from that uh, from those fees that are from uh, the, from those fees that are generated at the ATM. So if we're charging three dollars, or I think the national average now. It, is three dollars mm -hmm. so if they're if we're charging three dollars they earn a portion of that income do they is there also like for example um a monthly maintenance fee to the merchant that there's a residual split on or how does that go 
Yeah, absolutely. There for for uh, for ATMs that the merchant owns, because merchants can also own their right. ATMs and and, right. and and service it. Uh, there is a maintenance plan that we uh, we attach to that, and definitely that's additional revenue source for the ISO and agent. Yes. Okay. So okay. just to just to clarify a couple things here again, because I know you know because I know my own experience, I know most of the ISOs and agents have zero idea how this works. So just so they understand. There's primarily two different models here, and I'm gonna kind of state this and you can correct me if I'm if I mess it up here, Jonas. So we have these two yeah. models. You know, one model is where the business owner says, sure, you can place an ATM here, but I don't wanna own it, I don't wanna service it, I don't wanna pay for it. But then, you know, you end up keeping the pretty much all the fees that are collected and there's kind of this offset there because obviously it's it's not a deja vu terminal it's a little bit more expensive than a deja vu, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. right so you have that model and then the other model is where the the business owner says hey i know this is going to be profitable where we have a lot of foot traffic we'll pay for the atm machine we'll service it and reload it with cash um and then i would be assuming in that case there'd be some kind of a split between the business owner and and the atm company as far as on the fees or something is that how that works so, so that, that is correct. So let me let me back up to the to the first part where it's a placement uh, sure. opportunity. So in a placement opportunity where the merchant allows us to put a, an ATM in their business, um, they're also getting a portion of that fee because we're technically, you know, just renting. thinking of this way, like renting space right. in that in that scenario. Sure. Sure. And um, uh, so there's there's that percentage uh, percentage that goes to them for that. And then on the on the ATM where they own it and they service the ATM. Um, you know, so they're going to get a portion of that fee. They're not going to get a, a, the entire uh, right. the entire fee that's charged to the consumer. So, so that's where the agent is able to monetize part of that, uh, plus any maintenance fees or anything that's attached to it. Yeah. So the agent gets some. Just, just again, to make sure we all got this. To make sure the agent gets a piece of the of the transaction fee, the surcharge or whatever you want to call it that the, that yep. the consumer pays. Plus, they if there's a maintenance agreement, they get something from that. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, is it possible? And I, you know, this is something that just popped in my head, and I know we hadn't talked about this before, but I've often wondered: um, is there a lease? Is there a way where, like, the merchant can lease the terminal from you for a specified, you know, like a lease to buy kind of situation? Is there something like that? There, there's options for that, yes. So yeah. if if, the, if a merchant can't, uh, you know, swing the cost of a, of an ATM because there's different models, different, right? And some of them are very know. cheap, and some of them can be yeah. very expensive. Yeah, sure, absolutely, yeah. So if they, you know, if there's a merchant that needs to lease, finance, uh, or lease to own a terminal, for mm -hmm. sure, yes, we can, we can, you know, those are those are programs that we tailor for, the spe you know, specific merchants every time. But yes, it's available. and again, there's a residual opportunity there, I would imagine as well, right? Absolutely, yep, yeah, yep, exactly. For the ISO agent, that's going to be that's going to be putting that deal together. Yes, yeah, le leasing is something our industry understands pretty well, I think. So yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Really <laughs> but I just and, was wondering if the leasing applied to ATMs. I had never yeah. thought about well, that. Well, and, and before, I think too, it's it, it's it's of course different here too because. You know, our industry over the years, the leasing has gotten kind of a negative connotation in, in yeah. some quarters just because some salespeople will take advantage and, and pri you know, do ridiculous leases. Whereas with the ATM, I mean, this is legitimately like this is a really expensive thing. Um, and so leasing is a legitimate form of financing. But again, yeah, it can still generate um, profit. So, um, you know, this has been actually really, really interesting. I love it. Uh, I'm always I always love doing these podcast interviews because I learn new things. And so. I, you got me now. I'm like, okay, I need to do more research on ATM. Now I'm more interested. So um, <laughs> I'm sure those that are listening or sharing my interest. Where would you send them if they want to learn more about partnering with you in one way or another to, to offer ATM to their market and to their portfolio? Absolutely, James. So they, they can definitely visit us on our website at www.gowithstar.com. That's gowithstar.com. Uh, or they can email myself at ymarcos at gowithstar.com. Um, and uh, we'll take care of you. Awesome. And that was Y-M-A-R-C-O-S at GoWithStar.com, yes. right? You got it. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Jonas, again, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate the insights and taking time to be on the podcast with us today. I uh, appreciate yeah, thank you, James. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, Patty, Valor Paytech, the official sponsor of this podcast. Um, yes. I wanted to talk for just a minute about the shows. Okay, I know. And now I'm not going. I've had like 50 people ask me in the last week. Uh, Patty, you're going, right? You're going to be at the yes. NEAA. 
Um, actually, by the time this airs, I think it'll be over. I think it'll be over. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then it's going to be moving on to the next one and the next one and so forth. And so um, all of these shows, Valor Pay Tech is kind of the headline uh, yes. sponsor of these shows. Um, they actually sent me, I got to see their booth. I got an early, early view of the booth. It is uh-huh. crazy. No one there is going to have a booth anything like theirs. It's fantastic. Um, and so just look them up when you go to the mm-hmm. shows, any of the shows. Mm-hmm. Look them up and just let them know, hey, I listened to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Um, you're the sponsor. I heard about you there and I wanted to come visit you. So that would mean a lot to Patty and I. Um, yes. I, I am going to be at the MWAA. Uh, we are actually doing our big rollout there for ISOAMP, our statement analysis company. I mentioned in the podcast about uh, a hire I just did recently, which I'll make an official announcement about that really soon. But um, we're ready to scale that business up in July. Um, and so uh, I'll be at the MWAA and all the shows after that. Um, so it's exciting stuff. The show season is always fun. But yes. make sure you look up Valor Paytech. Before the show, go to ccsalespro.com slash Valor, V-A-L-O-R. Fill out that form. And even mm-hmm. when you fill out the form, when you reach out to them, just let them know, hey, can I meet with you at the show? Let them know what shows yes. you're going to be at because they will right. be at every show and they can do a little demo for you and things like mm-hmm. that. So definitely connect with Valor Paytech at all of the shows and let them know that you are an avid supporter of the Merchant Sales Podcast. We would appreciate that. And now here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. So Patty, today I want to talk about to hire or not to hire. That is the uh-huh. question. Okay. Yes. Um, common theme. I've talked about it before, um, but I, I've just, you know, I, I had, I'll tell you what, what started this in my mind. So um, a really good friend of mine, uh, he uh, was, sold for me back a long time ago in a previous life, like what would it be 16, 17 years ago when I was the sales manager for service oh, master. Like, right. Right. Long care company. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So he was the top salesman there. <clears throat> he and I got close. We talked a lot and, he ended up going on starting his, his own company. He ended up starting three different companies. Um, and now he's like the largest roofing uh, provider in the state of Arkansas. Um, and so he's doing very, very well. And he and I were talking and, you know, about this idea of, you know, hiring employees. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and again, to be clear for all of my, you know, haters out there, this is not an episode about how you should be a W-2 sales rep. I know you all hate that. This, <laughs> We've this been is not through that, that already. This, right? is, this is for the 1099 reps. Okay. So, but, you know, if you believe in yourself and if you're working hard and you realize that you have a skill for selling merchant services, you know, the problem that I have when I, when I talk to agents that fit that description is that they, I just can't seem to convince them to get them to understand how valuable that skill is right now at this particular right. moment in time. Okay. Right. Yeah. So in other words, <clears throat> if you know how to go out and, and sell cash discounting as an example, mm-hmm then do you realize like how valuable that is? It's, it's insanely right? valuable. Right. And so the question is, why are you doing anything else with your work time? Mm-hmm. I really don't understand. I mean, I really don't, Patty. I try hard. And, I, and again, I, I definitely get it that like not everybody wants to have employees. Not everybody is cut out to have a team. Right. But why? Like, I really don't get it. You know, people hate read a manage. book. Yeah, read right. a book. And, you know, and, and learn that. It's like, well, I'm not good at managing people. Well, I wonder if anybody's ever written a book on how to manage people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's like, I don't know, 200,000 of them. Pick one. Like, read a book. You know what I mean? Like, so, you know, let me give you a couple of, of thoughts here. So, and again, I'll say my own personal experience. Lately, I've made some really important hires for my own business. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wish, if I could have learned one lesson, like, like 12 years ago in business that I didn't learn, that I wish I would have learned, is mm-hmm. that, Hiring really talented people and paying them what they're worth is almost always a good idea. Um, oh yeah, you know, which, which sounds obvious, but again, it's like okay, if I'm if I'm an agent, let me be really specific. I'm an agent. I'm making fifteen thousand a month residual, right? Okay. Well, to do what I just described means I've got to go from making fifteen thousand a month to maybe nine or ten or eleven thousand a month because I'm paying four to six thousand a month, you know, for this person who's right. really good, right? Or I'm paying four to six thousand a month for two or three people that are doing more menial tasks. If I'm brand new mm-hmm. to this concept of hiring people, um, but you know, you not only do you gain that money back really quickly because you're selling, because you're selling, but you actually just raised your ceiling, like doubled your ceiling. So now instead of like you're like, oh, I'm kind of capped out at fifteen thousand a month, and I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, and I'm trying to install systems, and I'm trying to still make sales, and people are canceling, and you're spinning your wheels. 
-hmm. Well, yeah, you're probably capped out. I mean, as an individual rep all by yourself. I mean, I do know hours of the day (laughs) there are. And I mean, I do know a few reps that are making 40 to 50,000 a month as an individual with no help, but you know, that's really hard. And that takes a lot of work. And to me, I feel like the quality of life that you get from, you know, I mean, my business here, I mean, obviously I have things that we do together, like our podcast that we do here. Um, and that's about it. I mean, I do some of the content stuff, but really everything else that I do, I mean, I could walk away for a month or two and it would be fine. I can just, you know, whenever I want to take a day, I just tell my assistant, Hey, block these three days out of my schedule. I don't want to work those days. Mm -hmm. And nothing bad is, you know, like that's fine. I have employees to cover all these things. And so the quality of life that you get from that is, is hard to put a value on. But the idea is it's really hard when you're new because you're looking at your income and you're like, well, I'm only making 15,000 a month. If I hire a really good person for, you know, 50,000 a year, you know, what's that going to do? So let me give you a couple of thoughts of things that you want to think about. So again, if you are selling and you're really good at it, you should be asking yourself the question of what else am I doing besides closing merchant accounts? And Whatever that is, you should ask yourself, could I hire somebody to do that for me? Mm-hmm. How much would that cost? You know, what would that investment be? And what you'd be surprised is when you actually start asking these questions. So, you, friends, let's start with the, the first like, beginning, right? Prospecting, okay? Right. How much would right. it cost for you to replace your prospecting time, you know, or at least some of it? Well, probably like $15 an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is, you could hire a really good telemarketer or a really a go a young you know go getter in your local area that's willing to walk into businesses and use like a survey pitch or some kind of really basic you know you know presentation to just generate interest. A telemarketer could call and do a similar kind of thing. Um, now it's going to take you a lot of work to train that person, right? So when you when you hire people, plan to spend a lot of you know time training. I just made a really important hire actually yesterday. It's going to uh, you know lady that's going to be very instrumental in our business. Um, very sharp. And, you know, she's going to start on this coming Monday. <clears throat> well, I'm planning to block out an enormous amount of time to train her and work with her and show her how everything works. She's going to be in our uh, statement analysis uh, business. And so, you know, okay. I'm going to put a lot of time into that, but that time's going to be totally worth it <clears throat> because right. then I'm going to have an important a, part of your business too. I'm going to have a, <laughs> an expert and all that. And so right. the idea here is though, for those of you that are out there selling, think about your prospecting time. Number one, number two, think about your administrative tasks. So once you make a sale, what do you do next? Are you processing paperwork? Are you checking with the ISO? Are you calling the merchant back to schedule an appointment to do the installation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Then think about the actual installation itself. Now, this is where a lot of times you can even do contractor uh, agreements. So local computer guy, you know, reach out to your local computer shop, right? Mm -hmm. And say, you know, what are you making now? And they're making, you know, uh, $40 an hour, right? Say, I'll pay you $50 an hour to do my installs for me. Mm-hmm. Well, now, you know, if the install takes two hours, it's a hundred bucks. It's a point of sale system and it takes eight hours and it's 400 bucks. Right. Um, right. But during that period of time, you know, you're like, well, I can't pay $400 for eight hours. Wait a minute. If you all you were doing, $8? if all you were doing was closing merchant accounts for eight straight hours, how much would you grow your residual? And it's right. like, well, I would find three new deals and each would bring me 200 bucks a month. Okay, so are you willing to give up $800 in order to get 600 a month? Yeah, that's a good deal, right? right. So right. that that's the kind of numbers that you, you have to think about. So you have to start thinking about your time a little bit differently. And so I just really want to challenge our audience here um, to think about that. Now, let me go to the other side of this. So that's, I'm talking about the individual agents, you know, brand new. Now, let me go to those of you that have an ISO, mm-hmm. right? And you have a company. You know, we just talked, um, you know, we're, we're talking in this episode about, um, you know, Patty and the Insiders Report talking about these, all these new businesses started and, and COVID and stuff. One of the things that that's done is opened up a, a lot of available capital. You know, some of you really cashed in on the, the PPP. Uh, maybe you got the EIDL, uh, the EIDL increase, you know, all these different things. Uh, or maybe you can get capital from another source. But, you know, what are you doing in your in your business, in your ISO? You know, mm-hmm. could you, do you have somebody that's really good at, the financial side of things? Do you have somebody that's really good at the marketing? Do you have somebody, you know, where are these holes? And let me, let me challenge those of you that actually have some money that are building a business. Let me challenge you to the same lesson I wish I would have learned 12 years ago, which is given the choice between hiring the 35, 40,000 a year person or the 70 to 80,000 a year person, uh-huh. I want the 70 to 80,000 a year person almost every time without exception. 
um, mm-hmm. as the first do so much more. Yeah. A- as the first person. Right. So another, mm-hmm. so here, here's what everybody does. Here's what everybody does. And this is a mistake. So it's, I'm having fun actually recording this. I realize I'm probably not making as much sense as I usually do, but as these thoughts are forming in my head, it's like, you know, everybody gets this idea, including me where it's like, all right, I'm growing. What do I do? Well, let me hire a 35,000 a year person to delegate this to. And then as I grow, I'll eventually hire their manager. Right. Right. Yeah. Wrong. Not going to work, <laughs> frankly, if the, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, well, the uh, problem, the problem is your, issues there. <laughs> well, not only that, but the problem is you're never going to, it's going to be a long time until you have enough money to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. And mm-hmm. so what's going to happen though, is that person is going to be potentially like an anchor kind of pulling you down of like, this ongoing thing of like working with them and working with them and working with them and supporting them and supporting us. Right. Again, there's nothing wrong with somebody making 35, 40,000 a year. I'm not saying that's bad or that person's not no. valuable. I'm just saying no, no, no. their level of skill and experience at that point in their career, they need a lot of further development. Like that's why right. they're only 40,000 a year versus 80. Right. But if you get the person that's higher, you know, they're going to come in and like take a load off of you and they're going to bring fresh ideas right. and they're going to help sure. you grow sure. and they're going to help you grow so quickly that eventually within a few years or maybe even less, you're going to be like, Hey, I think we're ready to hire that 35,000 a year person to help the 80,000 a year person. Right. Right. But see now you don't have anything. You don't have to worry about the 35,000 a year person. The person that reports to you is worrying about them. Okay. Right. right. And so that's really where you need to get. You want to get to a point in your business to where you're hiring people who are very responsible. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and I've kind of gotten to a point now where the people that I personally want to spend the bulk of my time with are the people who are managing the people that are making mm-hmm. the 35 and 40,000 a year. Sure. And again, there's sure. nothing at all wrong with that. It's just that those people need a lot of development. And, you know, some of the best advice I ever got uh, was actually from, uh, I won't give his name because I guess I don't have permission from him to do that. But uh, a, a friend of mine who, uh, you know, ran a massive ISO and was the CEO of the company, started it from scratch and then sold it. And I, I was talking to him and, and the thing he told me is he said, James, you know, training people and helping people develop is, is rewarding. And sometimes it's the right thing to do, but just remember, you're never going to get those years back. Right. And so all those years that you spend, you know, helping these people develop into the person you need them to be for your business, those years could have been spent with the person who's already Already. there and they would be helping you grow faster. So you don't get those years back. Um, And so again, I'm not saying it's, you know, again, you're really small. You can only afford what you can afford. You have, you have two or three very, different tasks that need to be done. Well, of course you can't afford to hire an 80,000 a year person for all three, right? So right. that's fine. You're new. You hire a part-timer to do one. You hire, do a contractor to do the other one. And you know, that's, I get that. Like that's fine. And then, then you are developing them. I mean, that's, and it should be your mission in life when you're at that stage, it should be your mission to help those people grow. I have people in my company that have worked for me now for over 10 years and you know, mm-hmm. I've, I've helped them develop. I've trained them. I've seen them grow and now they, they have more responsibilities. And so that's crucial. And I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but right. for those of you that are the ISOs and you're trying to build a big company, take a step back for a second and understand that making that investment now, um, usually if you invest in somebody at a higher wage, somebody that's got more experience and skill, hire them first for that position and get and work together with them to build the right operating processes, then work with them to then hire the people below them that are going to do some of the um, tasks that require less skill, less experience, and then let them help those people to grow. And as a result, manage. your life is going to be a lot better. And what will happen is you're also going to make a lot more money um, over time. It takes a little time to catch up, of course, with your cash flow, but you're going to sure. make a lot more money over time. But so in the long term, it's going to be m- much more beneficial. Yes. And you're going to be much happier. So there you go. Little, yeah. little tips on hiring today. I uh, just thought it's something our industry could use as I talk to people, especially the individual agents, but the ISOs as well. I, I find there's a lot of... Um, you know, confusion about that and and questions. So hopefully that'll help somebody out there today. Good stuff. Thanks, James. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. So, you know, there's been a lot written about the economic fallout from the coronavirus. Uh, But today, James, I want to focus on the flip side of that. Okay. Um, The U.S. Department of Commerce reports that there were 5.4 million new businesses opened last year, breaking wow. the previous record of 4.3 million, which was set in 2020, which of course is about a 25% increase. Mm. Um, wow. By comparison, data collected by the Federal Reserve indicates that just under a million businesses were shuttered in 2020 and 2021. So mm. we have a net gain of about 8 million businesses. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, you, know, that's, you really got to think of, you know, the infusion of capital 
from the federal mm-hmm. government through all of this. Yeah. Uh, just, I feel like really did some crazy did, things. Did something. And, and you got to figure a lot of these people were probably people who got laid off, decided, Hey, I'm going to start my own business. Right. I mean, how right. often does that happen? Right. Well, well and, um, and, and how often do you have enough financial runway to, to make it happen? Where it's like, you know, you're going to be getting either unemployment or you're going to get some kind of um, government funding grants, whatever. You know, yeah, exactly. You're like, oh, I've, I've got two years here. I could I could afford to start a business and live off this unemployment or whatever. So, yeah. Right. Right. Oh, you know, interesting. And, and, you know, and I thought it was interesting that, you know, the concentration of business startups um, were in areas that were most affected by the pandemic. Hmm. For example, accommodation and food services there were nearly a quarter of a million new businesses in that vertical in 2021. Um, retail trade, again, 239,000, so close to a quarter of a million. And of course, healthcare and social services, social assistance, rather, they call it. Right. Um, you know, the people that go and help out um, with that. Right. Now, for a little context, in the period between 2008 and 2016, the total number, you know, that's 2008 being when the Great Recession started, mm-hmm. right? And we had all that lagging growth for, you know, many years. Um, the total number of startups in the U.S. never quite reached 500,000 a year. Wow. Um, according to Department of Commerce data. Um, in fact, in 2016, the year that the government said it saw the most startups since the Great Recession, there were 433,000 new businesses. Good night. That's crazy. Right? Isn't it? I mean, you know, and to quote, uh, the, 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 there's a policy, a public policy think tank. I was reading a paper by them uh, recently, and uh, they described uh, this, quote, the shock of the pandemic appears to have caused significant restructuring of certain industries and a realignment of some relationships between business and customers hastening an end to the startup stagnation that defined the Great Recession economy. Yeah. Um, I should say you know, so. That really is a staggering number. I'm, I'm like trying to wrap my head around that. I mean, right? So you're saying in two years, 2020, 2021 combined, we had 8 million new businesses started. Well, 9 million, but if you subtract the and million, a million that went closed out of business. up. So we had a net gain of 8.3 million new businesses. That is just, that's, I mean, that's... All, kind of insane. I mean, we have, we only have like probably a hundred and what, 150 million adults or, or something, not even that many, I don't think in the U S adults say about 150. Yeah. So 150 our population million. is three something. So, so we um, have like, you know, what is that one out of every, one out of every 17 people in the United States started a business, started a business. That's crazy. And you know that most of these we're talking about are, you know, okay. So a lot of them probably are consultancies and things like that. But, you know, a lot right. of them are traditional small businesses. Um, you know, a friend of mine was talking to me last year. He was a nice so, And he said, you know, Patty, with all, you know, you hear all these restaurants shutting down. He says, walk down the street and you'll see that every restaurant that shut down, another restaurant took its place. Right. Somebody moved and, in and yeah. You know, and uh mm. You know, I think we also what we're dealing with now is what they're calling, you know, referring to as the great resignation, right? Right. With all these people are leaving their jobs. Many professionals are jumping from working for a biz- big business to starting their own small businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and a study from, in fact, a study from Intuit predicts 5.6 million new small businesses this year, um, which, of course, would top last year's five. What did I say that was? 5.3? What was it? 5.4, um, 5.4 million. Wow. So just over that, you know, as I was uh, compiling this data, I was reminded of a podcast interview we did back in, I believe it was February with Dustin Magazine. I was, I was just going to bring that up. Yep. Yeah. You know, it just really kept, every time I was looking at these numbers, I thought of that interview because, you know, as Dustin said, you know, no business opens its doors as a million dollar sales company, right? It's not a billion dollar company, but it's a good bet that at least some of them will be, you know? Um, Right. Right. And um, and while new business failures are high, you know, that was, you know, about 20%, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 20% of new businesses fail in the first two years. That still beats the industry average for yearly portfolio churn, (laughs) you know, if you want to put it in perspective. And, um, 
And I think that, you know, like Dustin was talking about, um, those uh, catering to some of these small businesses could uh, create some real good sticky um, portfolios um, yeah. if you bet on them early, you know. Right, um, right. You know, and it's one of the things, of course, that Dustin said is, you know, the, the way to do that is not nickel, nickel and dine them on, on nuisance fees because they are startups. Right. Uh, but I just, to me, when I saw these numbers, it was like staggering. Staggering. I mean, the sales off, I mean, even if you say, let's just say 40% of them are going to be accepting cards, that's still. That's an insane three, number. Four million I mean, new businesses. Yeah, I mean, I have so I have like several thoughts that are just rattling around my head. I mean, I would say, you know, number one, this is a windfall for Square and Stripe and PayPal. And, and, and unless our audience takes those guys off. Right. And I think, you know, I think number two, you know, from a practical perspective, you know, all in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, it's been a while since I've advised my consulting clients to use the um, services like, um, you know, data axle provides where every time a new business registers that mm -hmm. it creates a lead, right? Maybe it's time to Maybe do that. Maybe it's time to do that. Um, and the other thing is I have to, I have to think, you know, with that many businesses starting, I, I can't imagine that we're talking about a, you know, a significant, you know, I can't imagine that the majority of those would be physical location. I have to imagine that I agree. the majority are card not present. And I would even go further and say that, in ways, this this could be a really, really good thing for our industry because, you know, what's happening there is these large companies, what's happening is right now they're paying payroll to people, okay? Right. Well, right. We, our industry doesn't make money on, I mean, unless you do payroll processing, right. we don't make money on payroll. No, they're not, that's right. not a credit card transaction. But let's say we have a person and they were, they're working a job for $70,000 a year. And they're one of these people that participated in the great resignation. They resigned their job. They were making 70,000 a year. Now, how are they going to get that 70,000? Well, now they're going to get that in consultant payments and things of this nature. And I've got to think that that's going to significantly drive up not only the volume of, of card payments, but it's also going to just drive up, you know, the, it, it's going to give us more prospects where these right. are small companies, that large company that was paying them 70,000 a year. Bounce. Uh, odds are they probably were already with, you know, uh, FIS or Fiserv or one right. of the big companies directly. And now this person's on their own and now they're looking for that solution. Um, and so I think this, Patty, could be one of your most valuable insiders reports ever we've done I because think so too. Yeah. I think as agents and ISOs, I mean, if those if those numbers that she just said, I mean, if that didn't make you say, let's schedule an emergency strategy session Mm -hmm. to, to talk. I wasn't even aware of these numbers. And I'm like, as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to be digging and doing research and, and thinking about how this is going to impact because, you know, that's, that's a crazy number. And again, if we're not careful, that's just going to put Square, Stripe and PayPal into a stronger position than they already have, right. Um, right. as well as the others, Toast, et cetera, because, you know, let's face it, our industry is terrible at search engine optimization and things like that, where mm -hmm. these businesses are all going to be looking for the right solution as right. they're getting started and as they're growing. And we need to make sure that we're out in force, making sure our community and the new businesses that start in our community are aware of what we do. I agree. I agree. I think it's, a, you know, search engine optimization, more networking with the community. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, more, more, more LinkedIn type of networking, because let's yeah. face it, a lot of these guys are going to be on LinkedIn if they're starting a new business, yes. right? Absolutely. Um, Facebook marketing, another, yeah. you know, I, I, I think that the opportunity, when I saw these numbers, a light bulb went off in my head and it was like, yeah. wow, this is like really great news for our, for our audience. It, it could be, it could be, yeah. you know, like, like anything, it's, you have um, to play it right. yeah, it's, it's news that there are significant shifts and changes in the market, which means that there is opportunity, right. whether or not our industry chooses to take advantage of that opportunity, time will tell. Right. So good stuff, Patty. Very, very interesting. Love it. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.